Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketeers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset uh, with an ever-changing landscape. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. I'm really, really happy uh, today to invite Richie Mehta um, to be part of the podcast and vodcast, actually, um, as we've uh, recently decided to switch on. Um, Richie's a good friend um, and uh, I'm very fortunate to be a mentor for School of Marketing, uh, which Richie set up. Um, and I'm always impressed and amazed at the great work that Richie puts his heart and his soul into. Um, so Richie's the CEO and founder of the School of Marketing. Um, and the School of Marketing um, essentially kind of tries to help get young people ready to get into the marketing industry. It helps connect young people with corporates. There are lots of learning programs, apprenticeships, and Richie will do a much better, better job of explaining some of that as we talk through this. Um, but I think it's fair to say that Richie's also an edupreneur. Um, he's come out of a learning background. He's worked brand side. So he understands uh, the dynamic of what marketing is in an organization. He understands the advertising agency space, but he also understands how to build a business um, and the struggles of uh, being an entrepreneur and building a business. So welcome, Richie. Oh, God, such a pleasure to, to, to be here today, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, I'm really excited uh, to have this chat. You, you and I always have fascinating chats, and this time we're actually recording it so other people can hear. So I'm scary, excited. Scary times. I'll, I'll do a no holds barred on this. But it's interesting because <laughs> I, the, the School of Marketing actually is my fourth venture um, in, in this world of, of entrepreneurship, as we call it. And uh, yeah, I've been doing this nine years since I stepped off uh, corporate land and uh, kind of venturing down the, the path that's traveled, as it were. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some of the trials and tribulations that it involves for sure. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely like to like you to share some of the story of how you got into the corporate world and some of the challenges there. But but before we do, maybe we'll just start where we always start, which is if you had a magic kind of reset button sat in front of you, big red button that you could hit, what would you hit reset on right now? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, so many things. Um, but I think the thing that's probably front of my mind right now, and particularly given the fact that we just heard some of the interim budget announcements as of, as of late and, and clearly in the context of rising inflation, the rising mm -hmm. cost of living. Um, in my world, uh, more, more acutely, there's a, a huge issue around youth unemployment and even more specifically student debt on the rise as well. It all culminates into perhaps, you know, uh, an unpleasant, turbulent sort of space that we've, we continue to find ourselves in. And I'm not even going into the sort of the more political and um, economic and social areas around Europe that's, that's being faced right now. Um, and, I, and I guess if we were to reset anything, it feels like there is an answer in hand, which many people, few know, and many people choose to ignore. And I feel that it's the apprenticeship levy and shining a light on this wonderful opportunity to help people of any age at any stage gain the skills that they need. In fact, the CBI recently called out and said 90% of us need to reskill by 2030. And so yeah. this is a funding mechanism which takes the whole equation of cost out of it. And it's a gift that's been given to us by the government. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I think we're not utilizing to its full ability. And so if I was going to reset, I would, I would love everyone to take more advantage of that because I think it holds the key to both helping young people at this point in time, but also, and, and more critically, helping businesses to really upskill mm -hmm. and, and become more productive and grow, which of course we all need as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and given every business needs more native digital skills, um, of course, there needs to be investment in kind of soft skills and kind of developing. But that's the whole point of an apprenticeship, isn't it? Unless people have exposure to work, how do you expect them to have work experience? It's always amazed me that people in corporates like go, oh, we're doing an internship or apprenticeship. Let me look at their work experience. It's like, what do you expect them to be able to show you at this point? Um, it's a really strange mentality that even with someone very kind of fresh and nascent in their kind of, well, you can't even call it a career, can you? It's like pre-career. But the expectation of someone sitting on the other side is prove to me that you've got the right experience that you fit in my company. And, you know, Paul, this is um, really hitting on and probably a, a raw nerve for me in many ways, because if you think about the the trade-off. So, so that decision point of an organization looking to hire that individual. And I work with a whole range of youths who are pretty much from diverse and disadvantaged backgrounds. 
And so yeah. even if that decision is made that they're going to hire someone, they are then in a, in, in a fighting pool of people who have had a whole range of other raft of experiences just by virtue of their context and upbringing and backgrounds have, have had an advantage. And it takes some convincing. And I, I dare say more often than not that I lose that battle um, to try and get people to see somebody's aptitude and attitude as mm -hmm. opposed, sorry, try someone's attitude as opposed to aptitude. Um, yeah. Because we know that if someone has the hunger, the hunger to learn, then they will and they'll catch up right. quick. But organizations, unfortunately, most of the time, I dare say there are exceptions, but most of the time just want to try and, you know, recruit somebody who fits into their box. And that's very difficult for me. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I hear you. I mean, um, having done some of the work that I've done with young people, I mean, I saw it repeatedly. Like when you ask them, what's the biggest challenge? One is I apply for something and never hear back, never get any feedback whatsoever. And the second is people expect me to be able to show that I've done all these things when I'm, I'm going to them in order to get that experience. So um, and I think, as you say, if, if you come from an underprivileged background or a disadvantaged background and you're up against, particularly in the, let's talk about the ad marketing industry, far too much nepotism. Um, I think 30% of CEOs of agencies are still from um, kind of public schools. Um, so you have these cliques and these, um, these often, unfortunately, boys clubs as well, where if you've been to the right kind of university or someone knows somebody, then it gives you access, which is horrific in 2022. And, Look, I know from the conversations we've had that you experienced that personally. So maybe it'd be interesting to hear the journey that you had to go on in order to break into, into business, into corporate career. Yeah, of course, that, that, absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll give you the quick synopsis to this because clearly I could, I could go on about it for a while. But <laughs> the, the simple answer is I'm from a mixed race background. So I'm half Indian, half Scottish. And I came to this country when I was 14. And uh, my parents got separated to so a single parent household. And I moved to Dumfrieshire, which is one of the most deprived parts of the country. So if you think about sort of the, you know, the, the, the typical statistics, I'm, I'm sure I'm probably f at the further end of them to, to achieve any level of success. So see, the mm -hmm. odds are pretty much stacked. But that's by the by, really. Um, what I would say to that is, is really don't underestimate somebody's context. And that's for sort of two reasons. So the first is, and this is sort of what I experienced personally. So the, the first is that you only know what you know. And that's troublesome when you're in that sort of environment, because that then restricts your opportunities for, for wider growth, because you don't know what wider growth actually means. Yeah. Um, and you're unlikely to meet the, those kind of people who will help you through that opportunity to work it through if you are from those type of backgrounds in those areas, because that's they're just not true. there. And then the second thing is don't underestimate the level of hunger that someone has in those environments to get out of that situation. And that can work in one of two ways. And luckily for me, it was a bit more positive, although the converse is absolutely true, where people actually then try and go for escapism. And the combination of needing to get out but not knowing how is a very dangerous one, because that then actually leads to a lot of societal problems that we're currently seeing, right? Whether that, that's, um, you know, mental health issues, whether that's turning to alcohol and drugs, or, or whether gangs. that's yeah. or gangs yeah. or, or yeah. crime. Um, so you've got to be very conscious of this. And, and I, for me, uh, luckily for me, I would say there was two things that happened, which, which got me into a new lease of life. And, and that was the role of education. And mm. it was all the role of the fact that my best friend's father just happened to be the entrepreneur of the small town that I was from. And all right. of a sudden, it was that combination of seeing a happier life and knowing a pathway to get there, which enabled yeah. me to get on a better road. And um, I remember and I recall this moment when I was at Wix, my first job when I was 16. It was a Saturday job earning £2.96 an hour. And um, heavy heights. <laughs> I know, the heavy heights of it. Absolutely. I tell you what, the day I earned £30 an hour, I was flipping ecstatic. I couldn't believe that. You know, I, I multiplied my salary by that, that level. Yeah, that's 10x, exactly. right? 10x. That's an entrepreneur <laughs> right there. It was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. But it took me a long, long time to achieve that. But nevertheless, so I was standing at Wix Timber Supplies in the courtyard, and I'm a small guy. And I couldn't push this pallet into the into the shop uh, the shop front, and mm -hmm. I just recognized and realized that if I was you know if I if I didn't do something about my, do something in my life, I'd be trying to push this pallet uphill my whole life, and uh, and that's when the, that's when sticking at school really made a big difference to me, and the fact that I, as I said I knew knew Alistair, um, who was who was my my friend's dad, um, mm -hmm. really had a big impact on on my my ability to know I could get somewhere where where the way the same way he did, and then I I ended up getting to Edinburgh Uni, and this was my first vouch or my first bout with privilege that really came off or came about 
And it was interesting. I had the most wonderful time at universities. I'm sure most, most of us do when we, when we go in and, and go into that environment. But um, there was two types of people that I found. Mm. It was the ones with the accents and it was ones without. And I know that sounds a little bit superfluous and um, I'm referring to public school accents and you know those posh type of accents versus the rest of us. But actually yeah. it has a, a, a massive, massive determinant, not the accents clearly, but the context in which they created those accents. Mm -hmm. and, and let me then explain. And I only realized this years later when I got to my first job. And my first job was on a grad program with HSBC and they sent me to Camden Town. And um, I often looked around me and I kind of, thought to myself, well, where did all those other kids go? Those, those mm -hmm. students where they had those sort of other accents from me. And life's a wonderful thing because you, you eventually always find the answers to which you're seeking. And I ended up um, getting on a fast track 12 week training program with, with people from other areas of the bank. And it just so happened that I found my long lost friends as they all ended up in private and investment banking um, wow. whilst I ended up in retail banking. And it was mm -hmm. only years later did I start to think and really dwell on the fact that, well, actually, why did I end up in retail and why did they end up in investment? And actually, what the trajectory of the, their lives versus mine, had I stayed in that environment, mm -hmm. would have been totally dramatic. Um, and no one told me any of this. And no one told me any of this because of the context in which I came, my single household mom who didn't know any different, the fact that I was growing up in rural Scotland. I didn't mm -hmm. even know what investment banking was. The only thing I saw was shop fronts, Virgin. right? Yeah. That's in my mind, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, you see the gaping gap that exists and it happens long, long before you ever get to your first job. And actually, in many ways, organizations are trying to do their best to change it. Everyone's well intended. But I think the reality is we've got such a, a long way to go. And some of those stats that you recalled still hold true. I mean, the fact that you've got you know, the majority of uh, C-suite people are from private backgrounds uh, or private school back backgrounds in, in, in advertising is a, is a good is a good stat to, to look mm -hmm. at. Um, mm -hmm. And so, look, that's that's kind of, you know, what I'm fighting against. And I think in many ways that's led me to my life journey. Right. Why why I started School of Marketing to basically help out these these young people from places where I came from to basically show them that there is a different way. Well, and there are thousands of young people that have you to thank for that, right? I, I, I always think the most inspiring entrepreneur stories are when it comes from a very personal experience like you just shared. And there's, there's a lot in what you just said there, right? The metaphor of pushing the palette and recognizing that moment, the, the everyday role model that Alistair, your, friend, your friend's dad kind of represented for you. It, 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 as you say, it, lots of people come from disadvantaged backgrounds, but they maybe don't have that role model or they don't have someone to give them a little bit of a whisper or some advice in, in their ear. And investment banking is one of those cliques and advertising is one of those cliques. Um, so so, so let's, let's think about the industry for a second. Then. So why is it, is it because we have so many people are privileged that we're bad at actually making the industry accessible to kind of a broader end, or, or are there other issues that you that you perceive that actually mean that marketing and advertising is really poor at marketing itself I mean but, but I, I did a career fair thing at my my son's school he's 17 just finishing his A-levels and it was like interviewing kind of year a certain year to give them advice on how to do interviews and like when you ask them what they want to do um, I mean if it isn't an influencer or, or a sports person then a lot of them have realized that you can make money these days because they see influencers, they see crypto, they see mm, there's entrepreneur really opportunity out there. They didn't really know how to grasp it. And maybe they say lawyer or they say accountant, like the, the really the really known and kind of understood careers, which doesn't feel hugely different to when I was being told what to do. So why are we so bad at giving like young people the kind of idea of the diverse careers? out Because what I said to them is there's this hundreds and hundreds of different careers that exist out there and within those careers there's hundreds of different career paths so don't just think you have to be what your mum or dad are which is what most of them seem to be telling me yeah well you know and they're the ones that actually had parents that could help them right they're not the ones that didn't necessarily didn't have the the, the, the kind of role model well i think um you know there's definitely a a peer group influence and i think you know typically parents play a big broad role within that within the context of that um why are we so bad as an industry? Um, ultimately, I, I actually think that um, we are too insular. And, you know, you talked about the role of nepotism, and I don't think people intended to be that way. 
I just mm-hmm. think that there is, you know, it's inherent in in the way that, um, you know, in, in the way that it's been, you know, the, the way that people try and help. You know, people mm-hmm. help in in a, in their own echo chamber, and I think it's very important for all of us to think about our own echo chambers and then step out with of our, of our echo chambers if we're ever going to try and make a difference or an impact. But there's a wonderful book by uh, Shari Cramond, who's the uh, the food director at uh, M&S. And uh, the book's entitled, You Gotta Win Your Own Lottery. And I love that thinking, because if you talk to anybody, a young person in, in that sort of area, the first thing that you'll say is, what, what do you wanna do in life? They say, I wanna win the lottery. And actually, no, you gotta win your own lottery. And you've got to, you know, you've got to create your own opportunities. Um, and, and you know, it's gonna be harder, to be honest with you, than what other young people would experience coming from that. And you will experience that. But it's important that you are able to break down the barrier, you know, and and find places where you where where help is available. So I think it's a two pronged attack, really. Mm. It's an industry that needs to do things differently. And you talked okay. about um, even in likes of recruitment. You know, uh, in fact, we inherently bias um, applicants from diverse backgrounds by the virtue of having a an assessment center. What on earth is that all about, right? You literally are putting, you're measuring people against a set criteria that you've judged to be the best people and you're not judging anything else. It's strange. It's just, it's a weird world. So there's a bias that happens there. And then the other bias that I think happens um, is is in in the likes of retaining top talent from these areas. And I'll I'll give you a good example and probably why I went rogue um, in many ways is because you end up in these organizations and if you're lucky enough, and for those who are not on camera, I've got my inverted commas on my fingers going. If you're lucky <laughs> enough to get a role in these, in these institutions, what happens is you are basically faced with a choice. You either fit the mold of that institution and organization, which let's face it, is a very Anglo-Saxon, middle-class, public sort of role you need to fulfill. Yeah. Or you basically feel out of place. And if you feel out of place, you are in a, a massive dilemma and you eventually either leave or you become very dissatisfied. Mm. Either of which option means that you will not be bringing your next person along from your neighborhood into that job, right? You're done. Yeah, that's and the brutal so, truth, isn't it? That's the brutal it is. truth. Yeah. So you drop out. And, and quite frankly, I mean, I, I dare say, and I don't think I've had any, you know, overtly um, racist sort of experiences in any places I've worked. But there was definitely an undertone and undercurrent um, and certainly maybe for me, it was just a need to be more impactful in, in what I wanted to do and finding my feet in this area was very important. And so as a consequence, I left and, and um, you know, now I fight a different fight, um, a fight that I feel is coming from the heart as mm-hmm. opposed to fighting politics in an organization. So I think there is a, a recruitment and a retention challenge that we need to look at um, in order to try and help solve for this. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, we're bad at getting them in, and then not very good at making them feel part of the culture, and that they have the same that that any minority has the same opportunities as the white men sitting at the top of the organisation. I mean, yeah. And what I often what I often struggle with is, um, and I know you and I think a lot about this because I think we both we both have a passion for trying to kind of break down inequalities wherever we see them. But when you when you blend together, kind of gender, background, i.e. social class and race, if you blend two or more of those things together, it gets doubly, triply more complex, more difficult for people. But it seems that we're only really able to deal with kind of one thing at a time in business. It's like, okay, we're going to focus this month on or this day on International Women's Day on women. But of course, um, like you've got to treat people as individuals and, and people that people that come from a different kind of social class and happen to come from a different kind of race as well are going to have it doubly as hard. So what, what do you say? How do you think about like those those dimensions? And what would you say to people that like, that maybe have this kind of one dimensional view of equality and they do like one bit at a time and then they'll I'll get to that later. At the moment, I've got to deal just with this this part. If you're um if you're doing that, by the way, right? If that's the the methodology you adopt, then quite frankly, you're coming at it from a very sterile point of view, right? You're simply coming at it from okay, we've got to tick a few boxes, and let's tick one box and then tick the next. The reality is, it's never going to work like that, right? But isn't but don't you think that most of D and D and I and stuff is still tick box even today? Well, I think well, you know, certainly you could argue that. 
Um, and I think from a macro corporate perspective, maybe there's an impetus to, you know, to, do, to be a bit more tick boxy. But actually, I think this movement starts from the bottom. Mm-hmm. And the way that I would, I would say this is, you know, it, it, it's a case of picking where you're passionate about, picking at where you believe you can make the biggest area of impact. And this stuff, right, like unmovable rocks, takes a huge amount of time and effort and patience and persistence in order Mm -hmm. to move the slightest mile. Mm -hmm. And so what I would simply say is everyone listening in, just choose and determine what you feel is the area in which you can make an impact. And, 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 you know, Paul, you said that the place that, that, you know, the the place where where most entrepreneurial journeys start from is when they, they see it for themselves. And so look, look inward first. And that's where I did. That's what I started. And and, mm-hmm. you know, that was very much for me, young people, my upbringing, my thought process, my experiences then led to understanding a more macro problem. Mm-hmm. And then what I would also do, and I think your point is very well made, is you need to overlay a two by two on this, which effectively is don't just look at a singular issue. I mean, for me, that would just be diverse people, young, diverse people. That's not good enough. That's not deep enough. Mm-hmm. Actually, what you need to do is overlay another dimension to it, which could be the strife, I mean, for example, the thing I'm focusing on right now is the strife of young women who are from diverse and disadvantaged backgrounds trying to get into our industry. So all of a sudden, I'm honing in on a much more specific set of Mm -hmm. issues, values, barriers, which we could then solve for. And and it becomes tangible. And it becomes, you know, it doesn't become the scale that everyone wants to think about in life today. Everything's about scale. It doesn't have to be about that. No, no, no. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. We can just influence a few people and that's great. You know, you're changing the lives of them and then there's a ripple effect. So I would say that. I would say don't don't necessarily think about it as tick box. Look at it as what you're passionate about and where you believe you can have the biggest area of impact. And then just go for it and chip away, guys. Chip away. It's not a it's not a it's not a sprint here, it's a marathon. I agree. I agree. Um so let's I, I just want to circle back to your point about um apprenticeships and the apprenticeship levy um because i remember i I can't remember exactly what it was but a few years ago when it was announced there was a lot of communication from hr teams everywhere going oh don't forget this this is a real opportunity and then of course like most communication that died down and I, i don't think i hear that phrase apprenticeship levy talked about very much in boardrooms or um in in business um anywhere near enough and i think that's was kind of your point so yeah let's dig a bit deeper into that and why you believe so passionately that can actually help solve some of the problems that we're talking about yeah of course well look, look let me first start off with a bit of a stat right 300 million pounds every year go back into the government coffers because companies are not spending their apprenticeship levy it's an organ it's a it's a it's a funding mechanism where an organization has to pay for any, any large organization with a wage bill of over three million pounds has to pay 0.5 of that bill into the apprenticeship levy. If they don't mm-hmm. spend it, they lose it. And so I've never in all my days come across an organization that's up to 100% utilization. So they're losing money. It's money on the table. It's money on the mm-hmm. table. They're not spending in upskilling their teams, despite them talking a good game about the fact that they are, they're such a great organization, yada, yada, yada. If you're not yeah. spending the biggest mm-hmm. funding pot that you put into your learning and development, then you're clearly not a learning culture. You're not a learning organization. So, so let's look at ourselves hard in the mirror um, versus that. Okay. So that's, that's, that's point A, really. Um, and, and when I think about the opportunity to help solve the challenges, the good news about that is, is if you're not using it, it actually goes into a central pot that smaller companies can use. So the reality is that small companies don't know this exists and large companies are not utilizing it in the right way. So actually at a macro level, mm-hmm. this is the, the number one solution to take money out of the equation to help upskill your teams and help people grow. And apprenticeships can actually come take place across any sort of discipline. There's over 1,000 apprenticeship standards. So there's over 1,000 different learning opportunities that you can take to be able to upskill your teams. Now, Paul, you mentioned digital skills, but mm-hmm. they work. it works in exactly the same way if you wanna be a joiner, if you wanna be a software engineer, if you wanna be a data scientist. Um, you know, there's just too many. I mean, there's, there's um, apprenticeships in creatives in the creative space. If you want to be a creative or account director mm-hmm. or account manager, anything. I mean, literally, you you name it, there'll be an apprenticeship for it. So, right. you know, when you think in that context, there is there's no, there's an abundance of, of an opportunity, and for the first time in our lives, there is an abundance of money floating around to make this work. 
So if you identify the need correctly, you can give a young person opportunity, decreasing unemployment, but you can mm. also increase your productivity in your business by, by doing this. Win, flipping, win. <laughs> right. why, why are not people doing this? It just, it seems ludicrous to me. It seems like it's... But what would, what, what would you say for, for the people listening? They're going, oh, forgotten about that. That's a really good point. I want to go and do something about it. What, what's the first thing you'd suggest they do? Well, I think the first thing they need to do is they need to go and speak. If they're a large company, they need to go speak to their HR team and basically say, simple question, guys, very simple. What is our current apprenticeship levy utilization? Full stop or question mark, right? Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you it'll be an embarrassing answer. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's in a small business who wants to take advantage of this, you get a 95% discount on any program that you want to run. So in our digital marketing program, um, it, it costs 11,000 pounds, but a small business gets it for 550. So wow. it's an incredible discount and it takes about 15 minutes to reserve the funding. So go reserve the funding today. Simple. That's the first thing I would say. Mm. The next thing you can worry about what exactly is it that you want people to be trained on, but right. the, the money's there for the taking. So the economics are there. Then we work out the needs and then we get the right people in the right places and, and uh, shebang magic happens. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty compelling, compelling, uh, <laughs> Com a, a proposition when you say it like that and, and, and where, where where maybe it's a sector or types of companies um is there anyone doing it really well or, or are you not seeing are you just think across the board it's actually pretty poor well i mean i've never come across an organization that is at full utilization and by the way if someone there if someone out there knows one yeah, that tell us. Please, yeah, please, please, please tell me i would love please to write I'd in love, and tell us <laughs> i would love to hear um but although you know i think there are organizations that are doing it well uh, bt is a good example of that amazon is a good example of that um okay two of them anyway that that i that i've seen that are are making strides and by the way if you don't utilize your levy you can donate it to other companies as well so they don't even have to pay the 500 give it back otherwise right so you might as well do something meaningful with it that's it exactly so you know it's a great opportunity um and it's a great opportunity to really solve some of these big problems that we've just described at the outset so i would really say go for it and there's a misconception and i think there's an inertia i mean i'll give you a good example i was on linkedin the other day and, I, and by the way for anyone who um probably gets annoyed at me because when you post a job i always kind of put a comment in going oh do you think about apprenticeships uh, and, and i'm sure some people get annoyed by that but i thought but there was a there was a job advert from a marketing exec the other day and i literally just said oh this sounds like a great job opportunity maybe it's an apprenticeship opportunity you know we can train them up you can get the get the right skills you need and they said no it's a full-time opportunity no experience required but no we don't want to take on them as an apprentice i'm kind of like really is that is that the thought is that what you you know mm -hmm. You, you want to do all the hard work yourself? I, I don't think, I just simply think that people just are not aware. You know, they don't really understand what it's all about. Right, it's and just not top away. of mind. I think it's just not top of mind too often, right? I mean, I can yeah. probably say there hasn't been top of mind for me enough at times. That's it. And you know, Paul, if you think about this, the apprenticeship levy has been around four or five years, right? Mm. Um, higher education, if you think about, I think Oxford was the first university in this country, it was in the 1600s or 1500s, actually, even, even so. So we're fighting against, uh, an alt we're coming up against an education revolution and mm. we're fighting against being the new kid on the block. And this is going to take time. And that's fine, right? I'm here for the long haul. I'm here for the game. So let's do it. Let's fight it out. That's no problem. But There's a rally cry if ever I heard one. Why um, not? So ch changing direction a little bit. I mean, you said earlier on that you've you've started four companies and this is your fourth business. And um, I know you, you, I know that you're very happy with where you've got it to, but equally, I know it's taken you longer than you wanted to, right? So t t tell us a bit about the reality of being an entrepreneur that isn't the Instagram pictures and isn't the kind of the, the gloss that someone see. Like, what, what, what's it really like and what has it taught you as an individual? Well, I mean, lucky for me, I'm not very photogenic. So, you know, that kind of stuff comes That's a bit to the side. Oh, you're very kind, Paul. You're very kind. I was actually, I was angling to see for you to say that. Um, <laughs> but um, but more, more so than that, um, I think, I think first of all, let's maybe break this down in a few stages here. The first thing is the start, right? And I think there's a lot of people in corporate land and thinking about kind of, you know, going rogue and going on your own and, and, and you know, have a lot more, a lot to, to offer. And the, the moment that it really made shape for me was, um, unfortunately, Alistair passed away. That, that mentor. Um, but he was a role model, really, for me. And um, it was a moment in time where I thought, well, actually, I've got to 
if I want to live my life the way I want to live my life, knowing that it's finite and, you know, seeing it so close to home, um, I need to do something very different. And uh, it was almost like that fulfilling of destiny moment where there's a perfect storm on your life. And, you know, personally, I was going through a lot of turbulence, massive breakup on a personal level, um, meant I could have moved back into a flat chair, um, not terribly happy in my workplace and recognizing that I think education had a bit of a calling. So it was a bit of a Steve Jobs moment. And mm. the and, and I remember then and distinctly remember this moment when I was talking to one of my other mentors and I sort of he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to start a business school and a business school to help the kind of young people that we're talking about. And, uh, you know, with open arms, he kind of said, I think that's a great, great thing to be thinking about. But guys, that was nine years ago. And uh, I started School of Marketing about three, maybe two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the seven years prior to that, right? Uh, no one knows. No one, no one hears it. Um, and it was awfully unglamorous um, mm -hmm. in, in, that, in, that, in that mix. So you kind of, I, I always had this little saying that you got to rise like a phoenix. Um, and I certainly it's, not, it's certainly not my saying. But it was, it was always that moment of incubation where I was waiting and waiting and waiting and just earning my craft, learning my craft, learning education. And I became a marketing lecturer back in that time. And all I was doing was really understanding how education and the industry works. Right. Um, and then I scaled into a digital learning production house, which became really successful. Mm, but um, recognizing that an agency model was always going to be have a lack of scale to it. I needed to get into a product proposition and fulfill my destiny of starting a business school. Yeah. And so there's a long, long road that that takes you along the way, and people and and you know people don't recognize the patience with which it which you need to have to endure that. Um, and also, I think people typically ask me, "Well, okay, so while you're getting there, how are you supposed to stay alive?" And, I, and by the way, I had I had no um, silver spoon, and all I was doing was doing the most mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, the most mundane stuff. I mean, I can't tell you the kind of you know, lo and behold, jobs that I've had back to minimum wage after having a successful corporate career in order to just keep things floating along. And right. no one will ever hear about that. So I think, you know, that that's the number one for me in, in if there's challenges of entrepreneurship is it ain't pretty, you know, it really isn't. And it ain't glamorous by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And you do reach a point where you, you know, you become proud and you've scaled something that you feel like you wanted to and, and you know, you speak from the heart because, Right. You know, you've had something that's where it came from. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, but that for me, by the way, I've only really started openly talking about this probably about 12 months ago. Okay. So there's, there's eight years of incubation where, you know, you are literally buying your time and seeing it through, uh, through the most, most, uh, painful challenges, you know, cash flow challenges, um, God, uh, you know, people leaving you, people screwing you over. I've been to court a number of times trying to regain, re regain money from people mm -hmm. who've, who've not paid up, um, you then go into, you know, how do you get investors? How do you scale up? How do you convince them? Um, you know, all those various things. And it's, it's really challenging. And, and, I, and, and, you know, the best judge of this probably is my wife um, in, in some senses. And she says, you know, she met me about seven years ago, sort of at the start of that journey where I was very enthusiastic. Yeah. And she often looks at me today and goes, you know, um, you, only, you only think about work. And, you know, you've become pretty unidimensional. And, you know, I can't, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to have a conversation out with what you're doing these days. And, you know, it subsumes you. And I think it probably makes you a more boring person. And you, and you maybe cut off a few dimensions of your, of your life and the way you wanted it to be. Right. I never, as a, as a kid, I was, I was a very enthusiastic kind of open-minded, mm -hmm. happy-go-lucky kind of guy. And mm -hmm. you end up walking around with, with the weight on your shoulders. Men, a lot of the time when you're right, there's a good I, I, I say this to a lot of people I mentor a lot of the time um, that it's important to remember that work should not be your identity and a lot of people make that mistake I made that mistake it sounds like you made that mistake a lot of people I share that with will also say they that made that mistake but you it? but you tell me another way Paul you tell me another way I don't you know in, in my world I mean how how do I switch off and go on holiday when every single day you are faced with an absolute challenge with, by the way, it could make or break you. Honestly, that, that's sure. the way. When, when, when it's your business and it relies on you, it's yeah. very, very difficult, right? You've only got, but you have only got one container. Um, and if you just keep adding and adding and adding to it, then it does, um, as you've shared, it does start to impact your kind of mental health, your, your kind of, 
your your happiness, right? And it's it's about I think like you've said, it's about getting that balance. I don't think you change. It doesn't sound like you change anything, but you're in, you, you you're very keen that people understand it's not a straight line and it's not easy. <laughs> Well, absolutely. And and I think that, you know, the, the, the joy that I'm now getting these days is with my kids, because they're one, they're one aspect of your life, which you love, you know, to your death. And also, they, they just have such a different, unique perspective on things. They just want the balls in the ball pit and they want Dada to lie in the ball pit. And they want to put balls on you, you know? I mean, it's so simple. It's just it's brilliant, yeah, yeah. right? And yeah. it takes you away. And I, and I guess I guess to some extent, I am trying to carve out now that we've scaled up to an extent, you know, we're still a small organization. You've got 23 people, but mm-hmm. we still we scaled up to an extent where, you know, I can I can have those little moments. And I think that's that is important to find those that's moments, right. too, you know, and, uh, and that's yeah. what I would say, you know, find those moments of joy within it. Would I trade this off for anything else? So if anyone's sitting there going, should I do this? Let me tell you, in my eight years, nine years, I've had about 30, 40 conversations. Uh, with people mm-hmm. who have asked me that question in, in those shoes. I'll tell you now, 28 of those 30 people have gone back to corporate life. So be mindful that if this is the journey you want, those are the other two that stuck it out. Great, right? Wow. It's a long road. It's a, it's a hard road, but I would not go back. So yeah. good. And resilience is obviously a really key thing there as well, right? That you've just demonstrated. So look, Richie, um, you and I could talk all day about this stuff, um, but um, we have to try and bring it to a close. So I have, you've alluded to some of it, but I have one last question, which is like people listening to you, even though you've shared some of the struggles, that they'll still think Richie's got it together. He He's built a successful business. He's got 20, 22 people working for him. He's He's got a good profile. He's very good kind of at being, doing interviews. I don't feel like I'm that confident. I've got some imposter syndrome. So could you share just like a bit vulnerably, like what are the things that you're still working on as an individual? Like which things do you think I need to get better at? Because I think it's important that people see that everyone's still on a journey. Yeah. And, and you know, I think everyone has imposter syndrome. And it's, it, it really is about, for me, reframing. Um, I don't look at it like 22 people work for me. I work for 22 people, quite frankly. It's, it's, it's the reality. And honestly, I'll tell you what I do. I go to everybody and I say, okay, so what's, what's bothering you today? Like, what are the things that's tipping you over the edge? And mm-hmm. I will typically do those tasks so they can get on with their tasks. Um, and it's as simple Urban as that. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's very simple. And it's only because actually my role sitting um, in the mix with them is to make, actually make their lives easier and take away the pain. And so they do that and take away the barriers and then, then, then they can get on with the stuff that they're very good at. Uh, and so that's what I try and, and tend to do. Um, and so that's definitely one thing. Um, I think the, I think ultimately if I, if I was thinking about what, what I'm working on right now, um, I would say about how do we scale faster and harder and higher? I've not worked out that conundrum yet. Um, the whole world of getting into so the VC land is something that um, mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm sure we're not too far away from, but I know I need to get my head into into mm-hmm. how that all sort of works. So we're always constantly always learning, um, and you know it, it it really is just just keep on going, get started, and right. and have that persistence. Um, and there'll be dark times, um, but I just you know you got to see a better day. I mean honestly, I probably think, God, maybe once a month, twice a month. Why the f am I doing this? Like, why am I doing this? And, you know, um, you just got to kind of push through that and hope that the other days you don't keep saying that. But there has, there has to be a point where, you know, maybe maybe the days are, you need, you need a change. And I'm conscious of that too. So I'm not sure if that really directly answered your question, but maybe this no, no, it does. No, I, I, I love the honesty um, and the candor. Um, and also, I think it's 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 real, right? It's it, it, it's It's... <laughs> you're just share, you're sharing what you're actually feeling rather than some glossy answer about everything's wonderful. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, and look, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. I mean, we've, we've gone from the, the challenges around um, young people being able to get on the career ladder per se, that challenges with the marketing industry, how people can actually themselves kind of kind of take a stance and do something from a diversity and inclusiveness perspective and um, what it's like to be an entrepreneur and some of the challenges but also the, the 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 excitement of having your own business and doing something from the heart 
Um, and really importantly, and this is what I want to leave people with is don't forget about the apprenticeship levy. And like, if you've got kind of some entry level roles or you're thinking about kind of hiring, then why not consider that as a, um, as, as a way of doing it? I, I'm certainly going to go and talk to my team about it because you prompted me to think about it. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other people that probably need to do the same as well. So Richie, um, all that remains is uh, for me to thank you, one, for doing this, but secondly, also for being um, very honest and uh, authentic as you always are. Hey, thank you, Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure.